This program is a video presentation via Zoom of the Civil War Roundtable of the District of Columbia. Founded in 1951, the Roundtable hosts monthly presentations at a location near Washington, D.C., more recently at the Fort Myer Officers Club. For more information, go to www.cwrtdc.org. We have a very full and interesting program tonight. A few weeks ago, we heard from Dr. Megan Kate Nelson about the Civil War in the West, and we hope to have her lecture posted on our YouTube site in the near future, thanks to John Ciccone, our post-production editor. Um, he has helped us post over 30 videos of our Zoom meetings, and we also have over 60 audio recordings of our in-person meetings that were done before we went onto the Zoom platform, thanks to David Hilliard. Uh, we hope to get Dr. Yarbrough's approval to post her presentation as well to allow those who could not make the meeting tonight to enjoy her presentation at a later time. Visit www.cwrtdc.org and click on the tab at the top, listen to past speakers to see our list of archived recordings. Dr. Yarbrough's presentation is a perfect segue from Dr. Nelson's talk. Dr. Nelson primarily covered the Confederate campaign against the Union in the West and only briefly touched on the fights with the tribal nations and members or with the tribal members' participation in the war. So it is with great pleasure I'm able to introduce her to, to, tonight to talk about the Choctaw Confederates. She uh, received her doctorate in American history from Emory University and completed her undergraduate degree at Rice University in Houston. Her research interests center on interactions between native peoples and people of African descent in the 19th century. And she published the monogram, Race and the Cherokee Nation, Sovereignty in the 19th Century uh, in 2008. And in 2011, she co-edited with Sandra Slater an essay collection titled, Gender and Sexuality in Indigenous North America from 1400 to 1850. Dr. Yarbrough's work has appeared in the Journal of Social History, the Journal of Southern History, and the edited volumes, Race and Science in Civil War Wests, Tests the Limits, Testing the Limits of the United States. In 2020, she was the visiting editor at the Journal of Southern History. At Rice University, Dr. Yarbrough's academic titles include Professor of History and affiliated faculty member with the Center for the Study of Women, Gender and Sexuality and the Center for African and African American Studies. She is currently the Associate Dean of Humanities for undergraduate programs and special projects there. She previously taught at the University of Kentucky and the University of Oklahoma. Again, it is with great pleasure I welcome to our group tonight, Dr. Faye Yarbrough. Take it away, Dr. Yarbrough. Again, it's a pleasure to be here with you, even if only virtually. And again, I'd like to thank you for coming and for the invitation in the first place to share my work. So I'm going to begin with a quotation. Then just as we starting to leave, here comes something across that little prairie show enough. We know they as Indians, the way they is riding and the way they is all strung out. They had a flag and it was all red and had a big crisscross on it that looked like a sawhorse. The men carry it and rear back on it when the wind whip it, but it flap all around the horse's head and the horse pitch and rear like he knows something going to happen show. About that time it turned kind of dark and begin to rain a little. And we get out to the big road and the rain come down hard. It rained so hard for a little while that we just have to stop the wagon and sit there. And then along come more soldiers than I ever see before. They are all white men, I think. And they have on that brown clothes dyed with walnut and butternut and old masters say they the Confederate soldiers. Lucinda Davis owned by Tuskaya Hiniha, a full blood Creek Indian in her description, offers one of the few existing accounts of the Battle of Honey Springs in July of 1863. She describes seeing native 
troops approach carrying the Confederate battle flag, the changing weather conditions, and the arrival of white Confederate troops. Her narrative goes on to recount the roar of gunfire that sounded like hosses lopping across a plank bridge way off somewhere. Davis offers compelling testimony about the far reaching and destructive power of battle on the civilian population and on the landscape. But what I'm most interested in today is the experience of native soldiers. What do we know of those soldiers on horseback whose writing style was so distinctive that Davis and her fellow spectators identified them as Indians from a distance? What can we say about their experiences in the Confederate Army? To answer these questions, I turn to the service records from National Archives. Compiled service records of Confederate soldiers who served in organizations raised directly by the Confederate government. From the outset, however, these records are something of a misnomer. This title suggests that authorities from the Confederate States of America enlisted these troops into service. However, Choctaw legislative documents from the era reveal that Choctaw lawmakers spent a great deal of time talking about their commitment to the Confederate States of America. And here you can see a, a map of what the nation looked like and what Indian territory looked like more broadly around this time period. Um, I focus on the Choctaw Nation and Choctaw Indians because of their strong commitment to the Confederacy, which I explore in my larger book project as well, which of course, I never get tired of showing people the cover of my book. Um, uh, and their commitment was so strong that even Confederate um, officers commented on the Choctaws as being their most loyal, uh, compatriots among the Indian nations. As a separate sovereign country with its own constitution, judicial system, and bicameral legislature, Choctaw legislators could choose to align with the, conf with the federal government or the Confederacy or attempt to remain neutral altogether during the war. They early allied with the Confederacy and agreed to place a regiment of Choctaw troops numbering 1,000 men under Confederate officers with the Confederacy committing to pay $500,000 to arm and equip said troops. Which authorities, Choctaw or Confederate, however, um, enlisted these troops then is less clear than the records title would suggest, which will also be demonstrated by examining the actual enlistment documents um, in a moment. In addition, I supplement the service records with firsthand accounts from Civil War soldiers more broadly to create a fuller picture of Choctaw soldiers' experiences. The majority of the enlistment records consist of pre-printed forms compiled by the War Department to facilitate efficiently and rapidly determining individual eligibility for pensions and other veterans benefits. The record includes a jacket with the soldier's name, company, and rank, and lists the other cards associated with his record. There were sufficient numbers of Choctaw troops that the pre-printed portion of the jacket or envelope stated First Choctaw Mounted Rifles, also known as Cavalry, Confederate in parentheses. The jacket often contains a fill in the blank style company muster roll, the company name and information, Confederate First Choctaw Chickasaw, Chickasaw Mounted Rifles appear pre-printed on this form as well. The form listed the date, location and term of enlistment. So that you have an example, here's the record for a private uh, Fulumi. And you can see um, that he's from second company K. You can see um, that he's aged 30 years old. You can see that he enlisted at, um, on June 12th, 1861 at Sulphur Spring Blue County for 12 months. You can see he's enlisted by Iskatini Homa um, and you have information from the company muster roll from July of uh, 1862. And you can also see in remarks that he, he was on duty on guard. So these are the kinds of records that I looked at um, in order to make some of these, reach some of my conclusions about what this military experience may have been like for Confederate so soldiers. Especially useful is the remarks section. In most cases, it merely indicates if an enlistee was present at the end of his term of service, but sometimes it includes really rich tidbits about soldiers being absent but without leave, about promotions or work duties. Um, a frequently included payroll form stated whether the soldier received, received a commutation for clothing for six months, generally in the amount of $25. 
Sometimes a bounty pay and receipt role for $50 is on file as well, along with petitions or official correspondence regarding the soldier. Less frequently, other miscellaneous documents, often handwritten, are included in the soldier's jacket. So again, to give you um, just an overview of the kinds of information that is contained in a lot of these military records that I looked at. Given our time constraints today, I will touch just briefly on some of the info you can glean from these records. First, the records indicate that more Choctaw served in the Confederacy than we previously knew. Second, the records can give us some sense of the changes taking place in Choctaw society. Um, we can also use the records to infer connections between the people who served. In particular, I will look at what the records can tell us about enlistments and how fluctuations in enlistments could vary based on battles and political activity. Most importantly, the records provide a glimpse at the experiences of common soldiers in the Civil War and remind us that the war was not just a rupture between Northern and Southern states. Other groups were drawn into the dispute. The contemporary Choctaw Nation estimates that approximately 1,200 Choctaw troops served on the side of the Confederacy by the middle of the Civil War. I have collected the service records for over 3,100 individuals for the totality of the Civil War. These 3,100 troops translate roughly into about 17.2% of the total Choctaw population or 20% if one excludes the enslaved population. In the United States, soldiers accounted for approximately 14.6% of the Northern uh, population and 8.3% of the Confederacy and border states. If one excludes the enslaved population of the South, however, 12.5% of Southerners served in the Confederacy. So um, I give you those numbers just to make the point that while 3,100 soldiers might seem like a small number in the aggregate, as a portion of the Choctaw population, it is large. Of course, this figure of 3,100 soldiers is much lower than the 10,000 soldiers that Colonel Douglas H. Cooper predicted that the Choctaws and Chickasaws would provide uh, in a letter to the president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, a number all the more astonishing given that the combined population of the Choctaw and Chickasaw nations at this time was less than 20, 23,000 people, including their enslaved populations. Cooper wrote, the Choctaw and Chickasaw can furnish 10,000 warriors if needed. The Choctaws and Chickasaws are extremely anxious to form another regiment. The data included in the compiled military service records tell us not only about individual soldiers, but can reveal aspects of the changing nature of Choctaw society. For instance, the names on these records simultaneously demonstrate the influence of Euro-Americans and the resilience of traditional naming practices. Names include John Simpson, several Thomas Jeffersons, a Jefferson Davis, a private age 25, but also names such as the following, um, Cubby, Ihana Tubby, Haikanubi, Shumpal Lubby. Some soldiers' names were a blend of traditional Choctaw names and European names, as you can see, William uh, Ayesha Hope, Shia Hika Thompson, or Louis Hima Kambi. The surnames of prominent families within the Choctaw political arena also appear. The Folsoms, the Lafleurs, and McCurtains are three examples, each family having produced district or principal chiefs of the Choctaw nation during the 19th century. The age data on soldiers from the first Choctaw and Chickasaw mounted rifles provide some opportunity for comparison with similar age data on American soldiers in the Civil War. Um, I won't go into all of the numbers, but the, I'll let you know that the native soldiers were slightly older than their American counterparts. The age and name data also suggest relationships between soldiers. Were the cluster of five Greenwood enlistees, age 20 to 28, related to each other in some way? Allen, Gibson, Harris, Hogan, and Sesson Greenwood all mustered into First Company E on July 3rd, 1861 at Blackjack Court Ground as privates, so perhaps they were. Similarly, Joseph Hunter, aged 43, and Stylin Hunter, aged 18, both joined May Tubby's company at Goodland Station on September 2nd, 1864. Could they have been a father and son joining in hopes of watching out for one another? 
The sources are maddeningly silent about such connections, but other data from the Indian pioneer history collection um, and personal accounts can augment these military records to confirm some of these relationships. And of course we know from other um, scholars who've looked at soldiers during the American Civil War that family, people definitely came from communities and listed together, that family members enlisted together. So we shouldn't expect a different pattern among um, the Choctaws. And I just want to point out the Indian Pioneer History Collection, if you are not familiar with them, are very similar to um, the Works Progress Administration uh, slave narratives that were collected, but their interviews conducted with people who lived in Indian territory during the 19th century. So there's a lot of really rich material there as well. The question of company assignment may seem relatively forward. Ind individuals mustered into um, company A or uh, second K or second D company among many others. As was common among other Confederate troops, some Choctaw companies were also known by names connected to their commanding officers. Captain Sinta Noah's company, for example, was also known as Walking Snake Company and Company I. Other companies uh, were known as Captain Coleman E. Nelson's company or Captain Edmund Gardner's company or Captain Shimonta, in parentheses, John Gibson company. That, that whole thing is on the record. The information was pre-printed on enlistment, enlistment records, reinforcing that the idea that these companies were very well known by these less standard names. And the use of both Choctaw language and English names is English language names is also noteworthy. Sinti is snake in Choctaw and Noah means uh, a walk or to walk. So walking snake was a translation of Camp Captain Sinta Noah's name. Shimonta may have come um, from the Choctaw word Shima meaning to dress up or embellish. Uh, there's a John Gibson, age 65, in 1899 that appears on the Dawes rolls as a quote-unquote full-blood Choctaw, and this might be the Shimonta, in parentheses, John Gibson, um, of the uh, previously named company. He's certainly the right age to have served as the captain during the war. The presence of these native names on Civil War military records exemplifies how much this quintessentially American event included other peoples who did not identify themselves as Americans. The data on the date and place of muster reveals patterns in where and when soldiers enlisted into the first Choctaw and Chickasaw mounted rifles. Almost 70% of the records include this information, which makes sense. Careful preservation of the enlistment date was crucial to determine when a soldier's date of service, a term of service was complete. As one would expect, there was a, a surge of young men signing up to fight at the start of the Civil War in 1861. Of the records that include data muster location data, half indicate enlistments that took place in 1861. June and July were especially popular months to enlist. The records include 950 enlistments for these two months alone. This Choctaw enthusiasm for the Confederacy is even more remarkable given that the Choctaws did not sign a treaty with the Confederacy until July of 1861. Thus Choctaw citizens were committing to fight in the war even before the Choctaw legislature had officially sided with the Confederacy. Historian Angie Depot notes that the work of consolidating Indian support began before any formal treaties were signed between the Choctaw Indians and the Confederate government. The Choctaw government had already passed a resolution in support of Southern states in February of 1861, through the formal, though the formal treaty alliance would not come for five more months. So gathering Choctaw support may not have been so difficult. Surely the Choctaw resolution was a response to the February 4th meeting of six Southern states in Montgomery to form a provisional government and establish the Confederate States of America. The Choctaws may have been waiting for the seceding states to create a more formal body before expressing Choctaw support. U.S. Indian agent Douglas H. Cooper enrolled Indians for service as early as April of 1861, again before an official treaty of alliance had been signed. Muster rolls show over 100 Choctaw troops enlisted in May of 1861, specifically on May 13th in Scullyville. And here you can see a map. And you can see where Scullyville is located in the northeast corner of Choctaw Nation. Um, and uh, a lot of contemporaries described um, 
Scullyville as a stronghold for Southern support because there were a large number of slaveholders that lived in the area. Perhaps this enlistment fervor was prompted by the neighboring Southern state of Arkansas's decision to join the Confederacy less than one week prior on May 7th, 1861. Moreover, Scullyville is located near the far eastern border of Choctaw Nation, very close to the shared border with Arkansas and Fort Smith. In 1862, enthusiasm for the war among Choctaw Indians was still strong. Nearly 800 men enlisted in the regiment during the second year of the war. January, March, and July were especially popular times. The almost 200 men who joined the regiment in January may have been spurred into action by the November and December battles that took place in Indian territory. Mount Round Mountain, Shusto Talasa, and Shusenna La. All three engagements were efforts to subdue wealthy Creek Indian of Pothle Yahola and his followers. Initially hoping to remain neutral, the Creek leader disagreed with the Creek Council's decision to ally with the Confederacy. While other Indian nations were negotiating treaties of alliance with Confederate officials, Indians loyal to the federal government were coalescing around Yapothle Yahola. And here's an image. Though his wife was a slaveholder, he promised freedom for enslaved people and many um, enslaved people in nearby Indian nations ran away to join him. Phoebe Banks, whose parents had been owned by the Creek, Perriman, and McIntosh families, recalled her family joining Old, Old Gouge, as a Pothle Yohola was known. She recalls, all our family joined up with him, and there was lots of Creek Indians and slaves in the outfit when they made the break for the North. The runaways was riding ponies stolen from their masters. Moreover, many free Blacks also favored the Unionist stance and joined the Loyal Creek camps, which were growing in size. Some estimated that Apothle Yahola had as many as 9,000 followers, but only 2,000 would have been fighting men. Colonel Douglas H. Cooper led over 1,400 native Confederates supplemented by the 9th Texas Cavalry to attack and then pursue Chief Apothle Yahola and his band. Each of the three battles, uh, each of these three battles that I mentioned punctuated Apothle Yahola's flight to Kansas. Um, enlistment patterns, I argue, might be connected to battles that, um, again, battles happen and then there's a spur of enlistments right after. So nearly 230 more men enlisted in March uh, from Lukfata and Nowood Red River uh, County in the southeast corner of the district. The companies raised in Red River formed on March 10th, most likely in response to the battle um, at Pea Ridge or uh, Elkhorn Cavern in nearby Arkansas on March 7th and 8th. And here, just to give you um, an image of one depiction of what the battle might have looked like, which comes much later, obviously, in 1889. And then here, a 20th century depiction of the battle at Pea Ridge. These come from, I'm sure your um, audience is familiar with, Topps Trading Cards. Uh, they come from the War Centennial series. Um, it's the art of Bob Saunders. And the, bark, the back of the cards have a summary of the war. There were 88 cards, 87 images with a, a checklist card. Right, it's a very different depiction of the war than that one that we see in 1880, of this battle than the one we see from 1889. Um, the first Choctaw and Chickasaw mounted rifles failed to arrive on time at Pea Ridge and the federal forces defeated the Confederate troops. The Confederate General Albert Pike pulled back his forces leaving Indian territory very isolated. The proximity of the fighting and the threat of Southern failure may have spurred Confederate Choctaw companies to form. June and July brought still another 200 troops into service. And so here you can see a map of uh, different battles. Um, I'll mention another fighting um, in Cherokee Nation at Fort Wayne in October of 1862 did not push a surge of recruits to the first Ch Choctaw and Chickasaw Mounted Rifles. The Battle of Old Fort Wayne was actually a continuation of fighting that had begun um, at Newtonia, Missouri in September. Union troops, troops had fortified their presence in Newtonia because of its strategic value, described as the granary of the Ozarks. The region produced grains and was home to the mills to process them. Moreover, the nearby town of Granby produced lead for munitions. 
Finally, its location near free Kansas um, Indian Territory and Confederate Arkansas meant Newtonia could be a launching point for incursions into Confederate territory. Colonel Cooper and the Texas Cavalry engaged Union troops from Wisconsin and Kansas near the small Missouri town and native soldiers fought on both sides of the battle. The tide seemed to be moving in the Union forces favor until, until Lieutenant Colonel Tandy Walker led a charge of the regiment through town singing their war songs and giving the war whoop. The victory came at a steep cost, however. The regiment lost eight men, including three officers. Uh, another 17 men were taken, were wounded or taken prisoner. Um, around this same time, the Tonkawa ma massacre took place in the least district west of the Ch uh, Chickasaw Nation, right, which you can see, um, and highlighted the internecine conflict that the Civil War represented within Indian Territory. The Wichita Agency in the least district was at the center of the action. The Wichita Indians claimed that their treaty with the Confederacy had been signed under duress, but groups such as the Comanches and Tonkawas had signed willingly. The Confederate government was not able to meet the stipulations for supplies and medicine included in the treaty. As Texans continued to make incursions at the agency despite their shared loyalty to the Confederacy, tensions rose to the point that Indian agent Matthew Leeper moved his family to the safety of Sherman, Texas. When Union Raiders, which reportedly included members of the Shawnee, Delaware, Kickapoo, Seminole, Cherokee, and Osage tribes infiltrated the agency, some Confederate uh, Indians joined the Raiders because of their frustrations with Leaper and the Confederate government's unkept promises. Reports of the death of a Cato boy and the suspected cannibalism of the Tonkawas suddenly focused the various groups ire sharply on the Tonkawas. The Tonkawas reported to Superintendent S.S. S. Scott that they lost 23 of their warriors and about 100 of their women and children in the massacre. The American Civil War then could exacerbate tensions within Native groups and between Native groups, in some ways echoing the notion of a war as a fight which could pit brother against brother or friends against each other. Rather than stoke enthusiasm for the Confederacy, the Tonkawa massacre revealed how convoluted the alliances between groups could be and the persistence of old grievances. By 1863, enlistment numbers had declined sharply. Only 189 soldiers enlisted. Remember, officials charted more than 1,000 enlistments in 1861 and nearly 800 in 1862. As in the larger Confederacy, by 1863, the Civil War had gone on much longer than anyone expected. The realities of fighting, familiar separation, and being poorly provisioned extinguished Choctaw enthusiasm for the war. As Confederate officer Edward W. Cade wrote to his wife in 1863, I am sick of war and the separation from the dearest objects of life. Surely many Choctaw soldiers would have agreed with this sentiment. Captain David Perkins, for instance, resigned his command of Company E in the 1st Choctaw and Chickasaw Regiment in 1863 because of physical infirmity, but also stated, and last but not the least reason is, I have so many little children. Unless I stay at home and provide for them, they must necessarily suffer as they have been during my first campaign. These men felt the tug of family and home and knew the suffering of civilians as the war continued. Choctaw, the Choctaw enlistments that did occur clustered in the first half of 1863 in February, March, and April, with no enlistments occurring after July. Of course, on January 1, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation issued by Abraham Lincoln took effect, ending slavery in rebelling states and parts of states. While it is unclear if the proclamation applied to Indian Territory, news of emancipation did spread to Indian Territory. If nothing else, Union troops often informed enslaved people in Indian Territory of their change in status. This is an image of Charlotte Johnson White. This comes from um, a part of the WPA Slave Narratives Project where all of the, these materials were collected. Um, Charlotte Johnson White learned of emancipation when soldiers arrived at her Cherokee master's plantation. Perhaps more relevant to Choctaw military enlistments was the activity in the Cherokee Nation in the first part of 1863. A pro-Union faction of Cherokees claimed rightful authority to govern and established a new legislature in February of 1863. One of their first acts was to abolish slavery in the Cherokee Nation. 
While many Cherokee slaveholders did not recognize the legitimacy of this new government and likely ignored this act, the fact remains that these actions uh, brought abolition and the prospect of emancipation to the heart of Indian territory. For some Choctaws, events in the Cherokee Nation may have hardened their resolve and led to the cluster of enlistments in Scullyville and San Boys, locations in uh, Moshe Latubi district closer to the Cherokee Nation that we can see here. On the other hand, perhaps Cherokee emancipation and Lincoln's proclamation led many other Choctaws to see the Confederate chances for success declining and softened overall enlistments. All right, so again, I'm trying to make the case that um, we can look at these enlistment numbers and these surges and drops in enlistment and see them as related to political events and to battle uh, events taking place on battlefields. In July, battles took place at Cabin Creek and Honey Springs that may have affected Choctaw enlistment numbers. And uh, yeah, if we go back to this map, you can see the battlefield location. Cabin Creek was located along Texas Road, an important supply route for moving military supplies from Fort Scott, Kansas to Indian Territory. The battle consisted of a series of skirmishes as Stan Wadey's forces attempted to capture federal supplies. The Confederates eventually failed and Wadey blamed the defeat on his lack of cannon. More remarkable is the diversity of forces present. Troops from Colorado, Wisconsin, and Kansas, the Indian Home Guards, Confederate Indian troops, Texas partisans, and the first uh, Kansas colored volunteers all clashed on this battlefield. Private Christopher Kimball of the 9th uh, Kansas Cavalry described the federal forces attempting the crossing. Major Foreman assumed command, which consisted of the Indians, five companies of the colored regiment, the mounted men of the 2nd Colorado, and Captain Charles J. Stewart's company, the 9th Kansas, Major Foreman, followed by Captain Bud Gritz of the 3rd Indian, advanced into the stream. Private Kimball's words paint a portrait of men of different races fighting together to preserve the country. In fact, historian Mark Lau suggests that the Union's tri-racial army in the West could have been a model for future race relations in the United States. Um, here, and somebody I noticed, I I. I think they're calling you Old Baldy. I noticed Old Baldy had the Confederate flag uh, in the background for um, his image on Zoom. His is less pixelated than mine is on this PowerPoint. So here's the flag that the Choctaws flew in battle. It's based on the seal of the Choctaw Nation. And you can, um, I would note the, the bow and arrows and the tomahawk at the center of the flag. Like Cabin Creek, Honey Springs was also located among, uh, along the important supply route of the Texas Road. In July of 1863, Confederate forces used the location as a stage, staging ground to prepare an attack on Fort Gibson and push federal forces out of Indian territory. Soldiers amassed at Honey Springs, here's one um, depiction of it from Harper's Weekly, and brought in supplies in preparation for the march to Fort Gibson. Again, the fighting would include men of native ancestry, of African descent, and Euro-Americans, a fact not lost on the men involved. As they waited for the command to advance, Colonel James M. Williams told the men of the first Kansas Colored Volunteers, this is the day we have been patiently waiting for. The enemy at Cabin Creek gave you the opportunity of showing them what men can do fighting for their natural rights and for their recently acquired freedom and the freedom of their children and their children's children. Colonel Williams also assessed his men's performance after the fighting. They, the rebels, received a lesson which in my opinion taught them not to despise on the battlefield a race they had long tyrannized over as having no rights which a white man was bound to respect. I had long been of the opinion that this race had a right to kill traitors and this day proved their capacity for the work. Colonel Williams certainly understood the meaning of colored troops on this battlefield for themselves and for the men that they faced. Private Edward Folsom of the first Choctaw and Chickasaw Mounted Rifles was on the other side of the battle lines and the colored troops made an impression on him as well. He remarked, it was not long before the federal cavalry found us and came over with Negro troops and give us fight. We had one side of Elk Creek and they the other. It was a stand up fight. I never did see so many wounded Negro troops in a small fight. 
Soldiers everywhere, not just in the South, were impressed by the combat action of colored troops during the war. The Confederates failed at Honey Springs because of inferior munition supplies and in part the combined actions of the 1st Kansas Colored Regiment and the Indian Home Guards. The Confederates outnumbered the Federals by two to one, but were outgunned three to one. And the inferior quality of the Confederate gunpowder meant that the downpour during the battle on July 17th rendered their arms useless, according to General Cooper. As the fighting raged on, the Federal Indian Home Guard Regiment inadvertently misled the 20th and 29th Texas Cavalry into thinking that the Federals were retreating. The Texans pursued, only to be met with a volley of bullets from the first Kansas colored and forced to pull back. Then Federal troops picked up the Texans colors. Tandy Walker arrived with Choctaw and Chickasaw troops late in the fight and was able to hold the federal forces as the Confederate forces continued to retreat. Dallas Bowman, a private from the first Choctaw and Chickasaw Mounted Rifles remembered. The feds followed us about a half a mile out on the prairie at which time our battalion charged on them and held them in check until the train could get out of the way. Native troops then were important to both Confederate and federal forces in the battle. As the troops fled, General Cooper ordered the destruction of supplies and munitions located in Honey Springs. Uh, Corporal W.K. Makemson of the Confederate Indian Brigade led the squad that set fire to the commissary and quartermaster stores. Former, formerly enslaved uh, person Henry Clay had been owned in the Creek Nation and remembered the smoke and fire as the Yankees burn up Honey Springs. But in reality, he likely saw the results of the Confederate rather than federal action. Some enslaved people also witnessed the battle and described the fighting and retreat years later. Creek freed woman Lucinda Davis from this lecture's opening, heard the guns going all day and all and along in the evening, here come the South Side making for a getaway. They come riding and running by where we is and it don't make no difference how much the headman hollers at, the, at them, they can't make that bunch slow up and stop. Davis's description matches Private Bowman's comments that Confederate troops scattered, which caused confusion, and we had a general stampede, in Private Bowman's words. Likewise, Private Edward Folsom reported that his company picket stampeded and broke for the mountains and most got away. Phoebe Banks' uncle Jacob told her the fighting at Honey Creek was the most terrible fighting he's seen, but the Union soldiers whipped and went back into Fort Gibson. The uh, rebels was chased all over the country and couldn't find each other for a long time, the way he'd tell it. Banks' family had been owned by a Creek family and followed a postlay Yehola to Kansas. Uncle Jacob had returned to Indian territory with federal troops to fight the Indians who stayed with the South, in his words. A disheartened Private R. McDermott from the 20th Texas Cavalry seemed to confirm Uncle Jacob's account. I believe they will whip us and whip us all the time or until we are reinforced from Texas or some other point. I know, I know it for I have tried them and they are as good as we are, better drilled and better armed. We got so much scatteredness in the stampede that we was three days getting together and not all have come in yet. It seems that Confederate soldiers truly had scattered across the country and did not immediately regroup for a counterattack or another engagement. The battle at Honey Springs proved to be the largest battle fought in Indian territory based on the numbers. Approximately 10,000 men met in battle there, nearly 6,000 Confederates and some 4,000 Union soldiers. The Confederate loss left the Texas road open for Union control and allowed federal troops to take Fort Gibson. Some view Honey Springs as a turning point for Confederate forces in Indian territory, after which white troops no longer defended the area in an organized manner. Moreover, the victory gave federal troops an avenue into Choctaw Nation, described as the fiercest and most steadfast of Indian nations in the Confederacy. Given the scale of the fighting and the defeat, it comes as no surprise that the first Choctaw and Chickasaw Mounted Rifles did not see any new enlistments for the remainder of the year. The Federal sent troops to Fort Gibson to strengthen its position in the territory, and July of 1863 handed, handed Confederate forces major losses. Confederates were back on their heels, and Choctaw soldiers may have viewed the Southern effort as a losing one overall. The compiled service records for the soldiers of the 1st Choctaw and Chickasaw Mounted Rifles provide a window into the experiences of Civil War soldiers in Indian Territory. 
These troops often did not leave other kinds of records such as journals or diaries and letters home were rare indeed. Service records include important information about when and where soldiers mustered for battle, for how long they enlisted and the kind of work they performed. The accompanying records in the service jackets, while uneven and unpredictable, offer th further glimpses of daily life for the troops. Some of the records that I haven't discussed today track the movement of federal prisoners of war from camp to camp and showed that some soldiers would choose to swear the oath of loyalty and even join federal units. Other prisoners of war were exchanged. The records also include more mundane though consequential information such as petitions for promotions, letters of resignation and certificates of disability. The records offer the opportunity to add meat to bare bones data about troop movements and battle losses. Thus a picture emerges of enthusiastic enlistees at the beginning of the war whose support for the war waned as they were plagued by poor provisions and desertion as the war progressed. Choctaw Confederates were not so different from Southern Confederates in many respects. Thank you for joining me. And I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. What a wonderful presentation. Um, exactly what we were missing in our last presentation, not that that was missing from the presentation, but uh, great to hear this aspect of it. A question that I had um, to start off is, um, did the uh, did the Choctaw, did the tribal members, did they have uniforms like the uh, like the Confederates did, or did they dress in a, in a different type of um, uniform? That's a great question. So there's some mixed um, information about that, right? So there are some artistic renderings of how Choctaw soldiers were dressed, and there the um, renderings based on descriptions show the range. So I should back up and first say the troops were poorly provisioned and the Confederacy didn't send all of the things that they were supposed to send in terms of equipment, uniforms, uh, weapons, munitions. They didn't send all of those things in a timely manner. So that's the thing that overlays everything. But the um, depictions that we have show a variety of folks in mixed um, uniforms, right? So some part of a, maybe a Confederate jacket, but then uh, moccasins and um, different kinds of pants or the reverse or entirely in traditional clothing. So it's unclear how they might have looked when they were in battle. I haven't seen in the materials that I've looked at descriptions of um, the soldiers in battle. What I have seen are, again, these art artist renderings based on um, a little bit of descriptive information that we have. They are being, as I say, issue, issued um, supplies from the Confederate government, but they're slow to arrive. So I imagine at some point they were able to have their full um, uniform, but the descriptions that we have suggest that they're mixing things together. The reason I was asking is uh, in some battles, um, how did the union how was the Union able to determine whether they were fighting a Confederate force or fighting a tribal nation that was just trying to protect its, its land? Right. That, that's an excellent question because there are moments that we see that um, uh, both federal and Confederate forces do attack their allies. Right. And you can make the argument that it's because they aren't sure because of the uniform. You can make the argument that they're taking advantage of the fact that they can attack these people now in this moment, right? That it's permissible. Um, sometimes the uh, Confederate or um, federal uh, soldiers will say, they, they all seem the same to me. We couldn't tell who was our enemy. We couldn't tell who was our ally. So we just attacked any, you know, any Indian that we saw. Right, so the uniform problem is a big problem that you're pointing out precisely, but it does make it difficult to be sure who your, um, to identify who your ally is and who your enemy is. And then if we add the next layer of complication with a group like the Cherokees who have their own kind of civil war um, along with the US civil war because they're, they're relitigating things, issues, political issues that are from removal. However, 
part of the Cherokee Nation sides with the Confederacy, part of the Cherokee Nation wants to side with the Union. And so then if you add that layer of, well, Union forces that come in or Confederate forces that come in might not be sure when they see uh, uh, Cherokee uh, soldiers, which side they're on, because it's not clear which, you know, within Cherokee Nation, what side they're going to be on, right? So it, it's definitely a problem. Mm -hmm. One last question is, um, you talked about some of the Confederate promises or the, of the Confederacy, and you talked about provisioning and, and food and supplies, but were there any greater uh, promises about what they would do with the uh, with the tribal nations after the Civil War if the Confederacy were successful? Well, they promised that they're going to recognize Native sovereignty. They promised that they're going to um, respect Native uh, territory claims. So the Confederacy makes it as attractive as they can to get the, the Indian nations to side with the South. And they basically say, we're going to honor all of the treaty obligations that the federal government has made with you. You don't have to renegotiate all of those treaties. In addition, we're going to promise that we're going to um, recognize, respect native sovereignty, recognize, respect native territory claims. And from the perspective of Indian nations, if you've already seen that the federal government hasn't been respecting those territory claims, hasn't been respecting sovereignty, then suddenly this looks appealing when the Confederacy, the Confederate government sends agents who offer all of those things. Plus, we're going to pay for all of your expenses if you participate in the war. Plus, we're going to provide you supplies. Um, there's the question of whether um, initially one of the um, negotiators from the Confederacy uh, wants to offer a way for Native nations to move to statehood. And um, the Confederate officials say, absolutely not. We can't, you can't, we're, we're, not, we're not including that, but there's a question of that, or if there's going to be some kind of representation offered to uh, Indian territory or to Native nations within the Confederate Congress. Right, that's a question. That's something that gets offered. Um, it's unclear if this delegate would have had voting rights or if they're just there as an observer who can participate in debate. But that that gets suggested as a possibility. So, um, and then the other part of the story that helps explain um, why Native nations might side with the Confederacy, which if you think about removal having been just three decades prior, and that some of these same Confederate states are the same states that were clamoring to remove Native people from um, the Southeastern United States, right? On th that reality makes you say, why would Native people side with the Confederacy? The other thing that helps to explain that is that um, these land sessions that are uh, made by Native nations and then the funds are um, invested and they're supposed to be paying annuities to Native nations are invested in Southern businesses, right? So there's a way in which the value of those investments is going to plummet if the, con if the um, Confederates lose the war, whereas you see your values are going to be, the value of these investments can, can continue to increase if the, if the Confederacy is able to break away, right? There's that element of, of why they're siding with the South. The agents that have been um, working in Indian territory have by and large been Southerners, right? And we can't ignore the fact of slavery. These are Native nations that are enslaving people of African descent. They have economies that um, in which slavery helps them to be, um, uh, to have profitable economies. They're developing social structures in which they are, you know, not giving rights to people of African descent. So all of these things together are coming, all of these factors together are coming together to explain why um, Native nations would side with the Confederacy during the war. Thank you. Is there, there any indication that those were true promises or just promises to get them to join the Confederate forces? I guess the real question would have been if this, if the Confederacy had won, what would they have done? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. right? I think that's the way that we would know 
what I can say is that the federal government uses the fact that these native nations side with the Confederacy to then make inroads on native sovereignty and to take more land, right? So they are punished for that. They are punished for their alliance with, with, the, with the South and they're reconstructed in much the same way that Southern states are reconstruct, reconstructed. They too experience some, some of the similar um, tactics and they have to uh, negotiate new treaties with the federal government in 1866 because they sided with the Confederacy. All right, thank you. Uh, how did okay. slavery differ within the tribal nations uh, or in the tribal nations from the European American? There was slavery among native nations before the arrival of Europeans, right? So native people had enslaved other native people um, long before Europeans arrived but it looked very different. So this traditional practice of enslavement uh, was usually the product of um, mourning wars, mourning as in sad, not mourning as in the morning, right? And that these mourning wars um, would be to replace people that were lost, you know, to disease or for some other reason you go and you raid or are the result of people who are taking prisoners of war for uh, when native nations are battling for other reasons. And so in this traditional form, it's just a few people who are being enslaved. The, as I talk with my students all the time, the enslavement is not inherited, meaning that those um, enslaved native people aren't giving birth to enslaved people. It's not inherited uh, from woman to child. Um, it's often not lifelong. So oftentimes these enslaved, these people who are being enslaved, natives being enslaved by other na natives are then often in, uh, adopted into the group, right? They become members of the tribe. Um, your adoption into a new group is so complete that there's uh, an example that is um, in the literature of a, um, I think he's Choctaw and he, as a child is adopted by another group. And then when he's an adult, the two groups are fighting and the people, his, his former tribe recognizes him as an adult and sees him. But even so, um, when they're fighting, they, because you often also kill prisoners of war, they kill him. They don't say, oh, we found you again and now you're back. They say, no, he's he's been absorbed into this other group and he's fully a member of that other group and he's our enemy and we fought him. He's a prisoner of war and now we've killed him. So um, so in the 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 traditional practice, again, it's it's not permanent. Often, again, people get adopted into the group and this adoption really transforms your identity. It's not inherited and you're not doing agricultural labor in the way that we imagine in the US context, right? So that's very different. Um, so then as uh, they're introduced to the enslavement of people of African descent, this older practice starts to shift and look more like what we see in the American South, what, what folks who are familiar with slavery in the US context are more familiar with, right? So in the Indian territory, then it becomes the enslavement of people of African descent. It's inherited, um, it's permanent, and the, there are more and more folks who are engaged in plantation agriculture. What does seem different is that um, among native uh, uh, enslavers, there tends to be, they're growing cotton in Indian territory, but they also grow a lot of corn, more so than you see among Southern um, plantation owners. They devote more of their effort to the growing of corn, which has traditional important value among these native groups. And outside, Outsiders often describe native masters as more lenient. Um, so often people will quote um, a narrative from, um, it's a man and I always forget his name. It's like a William Wells Brown or something, but where he says the quote, if I had to be a slave, I'd rather be the slave of an Indian master because Indian masters have more of the milk of human kindness 
right? So people often take that kind of description and um, white Southerners who describe uh, native masters as more lenient to mean that slavery in Indian territory was less brutal. However, another way to read Southern whites who complain that um, native masters are more lenient is that they're often making these descriptions using really racist language where they say native masters don't know how to be masters, right? They don't know how to, how to run a plantation, excuse me. So I think we have to take those kind of descriptions from Southern whites with a grain of salt. And we also have descriptions of Indian masters who are as cruel, use the lash, in precisely the way that we would recognize for Southerners. Oh, I have a frog in my throat. So I hope that gives you some sense of how mm -hmm. slavery yes. looks different. That might be a perfect segue to a question that Debbie Jackson has raised. Uh, Debbie, if you want to open your mic and ask it directly. Well, just mainly the uh, denigration of, oh, hi, thank you so much. It was an amazing presentation, but how the black soldiers were not um, respected um, when, with, with the white officers and wondering if there was just what the relationship was between the, the soldiers, if they had to come in contact between native and white Confederates. Thank you. So are you asking about black soldiers? Uh, and just native white, the white uh, reaction to the native soldiers. Oh, okay. Uh, comparing, seeing that the, uh, the white officers denigrated black soldiers and wondering if the white officers had to respect or not didn't respect native their native troops. It's very similar that you make it's you, you're asking a great question. It's very similar. They'll say things like um, there's a report from a white officer who goes to Indian territory and he says things like they don't know how to march. Um, they don't follow orders very well. Um, they're not brave, right? It's, it's exactly the same <laughs> kinds of descriptions, which is interesting because native soldiers also have a reputation for being savage, right? That language of savage and especially cruel, right? So it's this, um, I think it's a funny moment where stereotypes are, are bumping against each other, right? So you, you want to say that they're not good soldiers, but then you still have this other stereotype about native people um, being less civilized, quote unquote, right? And so that you have these interesting descriptions from white, white uh, observers where they'll say, it feels like they're talking out of both sides of their mouths, right? On the one hand, they're not good soldiers at all, and they don't know how to follow orders, and they don't know how to march. I mean, that I find really interesting. They don't know how to march. At the same time, that then there are these descriptions of those soldiers as, again, you know, savage, especially brutal, of, of committing atrocities, et cetera. Um, Ed Welch uh, has a question here, uh, whether the Choctaw Confederate veterans received pensions from their government after the war. And um, I guess it would be a state government. but um, were there pensions for the uh, Choctaw that served in Confederate forces? That's a great question. I don't know. I have not seen any records for pensions. Indian Territory doesn't become a state until 1907. And I haven't seen records of, of pensions being paid out for, um, uh, for service. So they're collecting all these records, right? I, I have these records because they're collecting them in order to more efficiently do that. But I haven't actually seen records where money is dispersed. That doesn't mean it's not there, right? I, I was interested in a very particular thing, but I haven't seen where money is dispersed or um, I haven't looked at Choctaw legislative documents to see if um, they're making provisions in their budget to, to have money to pay pensions out for people. I haven't seen that. But again, that doesn't mean that that didn't happen. I just haven't seen the records for that. 
Well, there is one question here, kind of a follow up, whether uh, the Choctaw were paid as much as the white Confederate soldiers. Um, they are, they fight really hard. They keep insisting on getting the same pay as white soldiers, but no money arrives at all. And so one of the complaints that they make and that a white officer goes to um, the Confederate government and says is that you haven't paid these most loyal um, Indians in Indian territory. And if you lose their support, it will be your own fault. They don't get any, the money doesn't seem to be coming in at all from the Confederate government. And so um, funds that are being paid are being paid in Choctaw Nation by the Choctaw uh, government, but they're not receiving money from the um, Confederate uh, government. That, that $500,000 doesn't appear to materialize that they've been promised, right? But they, at every turn, they keep trying to say they want the same pay as their um, white counterparts. And they also, the Choctaws also say, we don't want to be ordered outside of Indian territory without our permission. They don't want to. They don't want to take place in it. Take part in any battles outside of Indian territory unless they agree to do it themselves. Which again, I think, is an interesting um, assertion of sovereignty and assertion of authority on the part of the Choctaws. And we had that same issue with uh, the Confederates leaving Virginia and going into Pennsylvania. They weren't too sure they wanted to um, go into go into Pennsylvania for that same reason. Uh, John O'Donoghue, if you want to open up your mic, uh, you have a question about the Missouri ruffians. Yes, doctor. Uh, I know that uh, Quantrell and his crew or other Missouri ruffians had wandered through uh, Indian territory uh, during the course of the war. Did any of the Choctaw troops join his Missouri ruffians or other uh, guerrilla groups coming out of Missouri? I haven't seen evidence of that. Again, given that I was looking at records that are produced by um, Choctaws about their participation, I don't know that it would have shown up there, but I haven't seen evidence of them joining the Missouri ruffians, no. Uh, David Kent, um, I think you indicated your questions were answered, but maybe you have a follow-up question. My, I had heard that there were about 8,000 African American slaves that were held by the various tribes of the five civilized tribes in the Indian Territory. Does that sound about right, about 8,000? Once they were all pushed into what's now Oklahoma, I mean, they, they brought along uh, enslaved people. So how many were there and how many were from uh, being held by Choctaw versus the other groups? Um, so there's a point at which Choctaw Nation, the percent of enslaved people, they're like 14% of the whole population of the Choctaw Nation. So if you added everybody up together in all the nations, it could conceivably be around that number. Each of the, each of the so-called five civilized tribes had numbers in that area, in the teens of that percent of their population was enslaved at the time of the Civil War. Okay, so, that's good. Yeah, and yeah, I'll, so they, I'm definitely they, gonna get your book after this discussion, this was great. Great, oh, thank you. So there, so there are definitely enslaved people in, in um, all of the so-called enslaved people of African descent and all of the so-called five civilized tribes. And um, sometimes I get asked if the, the treatment varies in, ver in each of the groups, right? Because people usually hear about um, the Seminoles being more receptive or the Seminoles running away with um, enslaved people or the Creek. And so um, I usually tell people that it's a spectrum and um, the, the, the descriptions are usually that the Chickasaws are the harshest or the least um, friendly with with their enslaved population and that the Seminoles are on the on the other end of the spectrum and then Cherokees and Choctaws are kind of in the middle in terms of how they engage with their um, enslaved population. So Choctaw Nation, Cherokee Nation, um, 
they're making rules about what enslaved people can and can't do that look a lot like laws that you see in the South. They're making laws about interracial marriage, which look a lot like what you see happening in the South, right? So there, there are, um, these are societies that have slavery and are making laws based on the fact that they have the enslaved people in their communities. Okay. Um, I, if Kurt uh, lets me, I have actually have another question. Uh, the, the, the Cherokee, I understand, had John Ross who was in, in Washington and was doing some lobbying and to, to Lincoln. And, and um, you basically made the argument that, while well, we didn't really want to fight for the Confederacy. We were kind of forced into it. Was a similar argument made by Choctaw or any of the other groups that you're aware of? Well, the Choctaws up until they're they're up until they make until they make their statement and they side with the with the confederacy they, the leader of Choctaw Nation was actually um, trying to remain neutral kind of like John Ross tried to remain neutral for a while uh, and then there is a speech given by this is terrible that this man's name is not coming to mind because my student wrote a dissertation about him um, his last name is Jones, Robert Jones. So Robert Jones is a slaveholder. He buys slaves in New Orleans all the time. He has a large plantation and he gives kind of a fire breather of a speech and convinces everyone that they should side with the Confederacy. So um, they were, again, the leadership was trying to remain neutral and then Robert Jones gives the speech and, and they go full on to side with the Confederacy. What's interesting is then later after the war, Peter Pitchlin, who's the chief, principal chief after the war, he does ma make all these statements about how we had no choice. What could we do? We were forced into this to side with the South. We, we didn't mean to do it, which is interesting again, because as I told you, people were enlisting in the, in, on the side of the Confederacy before any treaty alliance had actually been signed, right? People were committed and interested in fighting on the side of the South. But he ignores all of that after the war. And he, he uh, paints this narrative of um, a population that was abandoned by the federal government because federal force, federal troops did pull out of Indian territory as the war was getting ready to, uh, you know, ramping up. People abandoned by the federal government who weren't receiving supplies and do and um, an annuity fees and other things due from the federal government. They weren't receiving all of those things. So what other choice did they have? That this was their only. Um, the only thing that they could do, plus you have all this pressure from Texas and from uh, Arkansas, these Red Raiders who are coming over the border and right and showing up at uh, political meetings in Choctaw Nation to try to convince them, no, you need to side with us, you need to join us, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll send somebody to come talk to you about what, uh, what kinds of um, materials and provisions we can give you guys if you if you side with us, right? So he points to all of these other things and spins a narrative that totally ignores the things that happened beforehand. And again, that they had a vested interest in what was happening um, in the Confederacy because they had slavery. And, and I would argue they're looking at the Confederacy and they're seeing a group that is claiming um, that they want to protect states' rights. Now, it's states' rights to continue to own slaves, but that they're trying to protect states' rights. And I think groups like the Choctaws are saying, if they're gonna argue so forcefully for states' rights, how could they not respect native sovereignty, right? I think they see a line between People who are making an argument about respecting that surely have to respect this. And then the, the agents who come from, you know, the officials who come from the, from the Confederate government say precisely that. We promise we're going to respect sovereignty. We promise we're going to uh, respect your territory bound, territorial boundaries, right? So, you know, all of those things together um, point to why they they side with the South, but yes, they do try to rewrite the story afterward and say that that's not 
in fact, what we meant to do? This is my good question, and this might uh, segue perfectly to a question from uh, John Cooper. Uh, you've touched a little bit about it already, but uh, John was asking about um, what the uh, what happened with the tribal lands after the Civil War, and then um, Carl Garman is asking about Albert Pike's role in supporting the uh, uh, tribal tribal members after the war, but uh, John Cooper, if you want to open up your mic um, and ask your question about um, what happened after the war. Uh, sure. Hi. I was just interested in, uh, you know, was, was there, were there net gains or losses among uh, parts of tribes that uh, were winners or losers at the end of the war? So scholars of, of um, this era and of Native uh, people in this era really point to the Civil War as a moment where the federal government takes advantage of the fact that these nations side with the Confederacy to take more land and to um, uh, undermine Native sovereignty. <clears throat> so for the Choctaws, and actually for the Cherokees as well. The federal government as a part of their reconstruction treaties with these nations says that you have to make citizens of your formerly enslaved people. And this requirement that you make citizens of these formerly enslaved people has um, added meaning because in Choctaw Nation and Cherokee Nation, people own land communally. It's not owned individually. So when you say to uh, a group, you have to make citizens of those people, you're giving them access to land, something that they did not do in the American South. They did not, despite what people ideas people have about 40 acres and a mule in the Freedmen's Bureau, as you all well know, they don't force a redistribution of land owned by slaveholders. But in Indian Territory, that is in effect what they do when they say um, you have to make citizens of these formerly enslaved people. So in Choctaw Nation, what you have is um, the people, the freed people are, are, are supposed to be given access to land. They seem to be farming um, plots of land um, in spite of the fact that actually the, the Choctaw government doesn't want to do this. And they want, they tell the federal government, the federal government says, uh, if you don't make citizens of these people, you're not going to get this money that we owe you. And then the federal government gives them the money before they've made citizens of those free people. So then the Choctaw Nation says, okay, well, we don't want those people. You can come get rid of them. And you've already given us the money. There's no consequence if we, do, if we don't do this. So there's actually a period until 1883 where the legal status of those free people in Choctaw Nation is not really clear at all. However, while their legal status is not clear, they do seem to be permitted to farm and farm land and plots. And then after the status is made clear, then they legally are able to do that. And so if you think about a nation that owns land communally, but suddenly now you're um, adding more people who can access that land. And then when you get to uh, later when they're um, pushing people to own land individually, now you're having more people you can buy land from, right? Right. There are more people that you can divest of this land if they've gotten access to it. So there's a way in which as a part of the treaty negotiations, um, there is land that's taken up by uh, the federal government from native nations, again, as kind of a punishment, but then also that these inroads that are made um, against native sovereignty are going to work in the favor of the federal government as they want to push uh, native people not to own land communally anymore. And they want people to have set amounts um, of land because they think native populations have more land than they can cultivate. And so um, if you then say, well, instead of just giving them all this territory and they can do with it what they want, if you then say, well, every household gets X amount of acres and then the rest you can sell to us, right? Then they're getting access to that land. So there's in which um, these agreements that they're making in these treaties in 1866 
are attacking native sovereignty, which is gonna give them access to more land and then lead to native people being divested of that land. So that's a long way of, yes, they're going to lose land as a part of what happens in reconstruction. And the other side of that story is that for the freed people who get access to land, this makes a really big difference for a lot of people. So everybody has heard of about Tulsa and the massacre that happens there and because we've just had the um, anniversary, some of the land in Greenwood, some of those original plots are plots owned by freed people who had been owned by native people who had access to land because they were granted citizenship as a part of this reconstruction process. Do you see what I'm saying? So because yes. Indian territory, because those native nations owned land communally and treated that land differently. When those freed people were made citizens, they get access to land in a way that, again, um, freed people in, in, uh, in Southern states don't. And some of those plots then get to be the, the basis of places like Greenwood in Tulsa. There's a point at which Oklahoma as a state, there's a moment when they have the most all, all black towns of any state in the nation and a lot of those all black towns, the founding plots of those towns are freed people who had been owned by natives or who are the descendants of, of people who had been owned by natives who then get access to land and then those become founding plots for these communities, right? So there's a, a huge consequence to what happens in reconstruction um, in Indian territory for those people. And so sometimes I tell people, Indian territory in a way can be an example of that, uh, a, a way to ask and answer that question. What would have happened had um, after emancipation, 4 million in, formerly enslaved people in the American South, what would have happened had they been given land, right? Because here we have a case where people are given land right after, and you can see some of the consequences of that. Now, some of those people then are also divested of their land as native people are being divested of their land as well. Okay, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. um, that's fascinating, I did not know that. Um, Carl, um, you had a question about Albert Pike and um, if, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, his statue was just toppled in Washington DC last year. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks Kurt. Uh, Hello, Dr. Yarborough. Question, of, you mentioned uh, Albert Pike um, with, uh, with uh, some of the, the Native American Confederate forces there in, in uh, uh, Eastern Indian Territory. I was, I was wondering if you could comment at all about, um, what, about uh, what role he had, if any, uh, after the war back in Washington, D.C., um, regarding uh, advocacy for Native communities, the, the extent of that. I've I've read anecdotes, but I, I don't know very much about the extent and would like to understand more. He tries to remain an advocate for them, but Albert Pike also has the, um, he, he leaves Indian territory in some disgrace initially. And so there's, there's this strange exchange that's in the record where um, he doesn't want to say what he's been accused of, but clearly he's trying to tamp down rumors about something, right? And there are other folks who say that um, he, he's, he's been drinking, right? So there's that underlying things, but he continues to try to be an advocate for the, the tribal nations, and they will often say that he that, that they still consider him a friend, right? And try to, um, they put him in positions of trust to negotiate for them. Sometimes with, I don't know, kind of sketchy results, it's, sometimes it seems like Albert Pike is trying to negotiate things for himself rather than from than for native groups, but that's the little I can say about what happens to Albert afterwards, Albert Pike after. The last question, as the enslaved become citizens at the forcefulness of the government and landowning, can you comment on their right to vote Indian elections in parentheses or American elections? Okay, so um, again, Indian territory doesn't become the state of Oklahoma 
until uh, the 20th century. So in this period, when they're given citizenship, the men are given the right to vote. Um, but then in Choctaw Nation, for instance, they are able to vote, but then there are some restrictions put on their um, political participation. So they're, they're able to hold some political offices, but not others right? Like some higher offices they can't hold. Um, there are questions about um, if, if some of these people can serve as judges, right? That's, there's some back and forth about that. So they are able to vote as a part of their um, citizenship rights when they're forced to become when Choctaw Nation is forced to allow them to become citizens. They don't get access to uh, the, the, whereas other people can um, improve as much land as they would like, the freed people aren't given access to, to improve as much land as they would like. There are limits put on how much land they can improve. There are limits also put on um, how much, it, whether or not they can receive any annuity funds from land sessions that the Choctaw Nation has made in the past to the federal government. Whether when, when annuity funds come in and they're dispersed to everyone, the freed people aren't allowed to get that money, right? They're, they're prohibited from that. So um, then when statehood happens, then it's, it's a whole other story about what, what kinds of rights they have access to once the state of Oklahoma be, um, arrives. I will say what's interesting in, in um, Oklahoma is that in their constitution, the it's written so that native people are considered white racially, which is different from surrounding states, right? Because the law, the constitution, when it describes segregated schools, says that um, people with any African ancestry are considered Negro and all others are white. Right, so that again, you can see a difference in what happens because of um, the fact that they're in Indian territory. Oh, Rich Jankowski, Old Baldy has his hand up. I got a logistical question. Um, Honey Springs and Fort Gibson. That's the uh, that's about thirty miles away, and if Fort Gibson is like across the river from Muskogee. Is that correct? Oh, if we go back, do you want me to put the map back on? Hold on, like, yeah, if you want, but yeah. Because you said that the uh, the troops retreated from the uh, Honey Springs battlefield back to Fort Gibson, right? Because there is a Fort Gibson across from Muskogee. Okay. Is that the same Fort Gibson? Can you see it? Yeah, I can see. I can see. Yeah. Let's see. And say your thing again. Is from the Honey Springs battlefield, mm -hmm. and you said the, the troops retreated back to Fort Gibson, correct? Is that what you said? Uh, let me go back. And I thought that's what you said. And I was verifying whether that's the Fort Gibson that's across the Arkansas River from um, Muskogee, what's now Muskogee. But it's about I 30 have... miles north of, uh, of the battlefield. It should be, yes. OK. Have you been to the battlefield? No, I haven't. Okay. No, when I was in Oklahoma, actually, um, one of the okay. Now I now I need to stop share. Uh, one of the staff people in the history department actually is a reenactor. Her family does reenactment, and they came to my class. They they like to do um, Cabin Creek and Honey Springs. And they came to class in uniform and talked to my students. But no, I haven't been out to the battlefield. Have you been to the it's, battlefield? It's Yeah, it's a remote place out there. I'm, I was glad you talked about it because not many people out here have been to uh, Honey Springs and or Fort Gibson. So oh. um, that's Fort Gibson behind me, by the way. Oh, um, awesome. But, uh, so, but yeah, I was just cruising Arkansas, saw a battle, you know, Civil War sign. So, you know. But great presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for joining me. Well, that's a great way to end this up. We've got somebody who's going to give us a tour. Uh, Rick is going to organize a tour out there for us. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Um, Dr. Yarbrough, this was a fascinating uh, presentation. You shed some light on some areas that I had no idea about. I'm always learning more things about 
the Civil War, um, just the nuances. And, and that's a wonderful, wonderful um, way to learn about it is in presentations like this. And yours was excellent. Thank you very much.